talking about the cult, uh, the cult that both Gayfesh and I have history with, a cult called Calvary Chapel. Um, this is a Christian non-denominational sect um, that has blown up over the last few decades. Um, and we both, okay, yeah, I'm going to bring Gayfesh in. We're both going to be talking about this because um, I grew up, just listen, you're going to have a good time. Let me just rename the stream because I realized the stream title doesn't really match. Let me just name it. There we go. We'll get the Calvary Chapel in the name even. There we go. All right, everyone. Let's do it. Let's get Gayfesh in and we will talk. Hello. 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 Let me move stream. Okay. Can you hear me all right? Yes, I can. Let me just uh, let me just put you up on here. Which which link do you want, Gayfesh, on there? You want your Bandcamp? Yeah, let's do my Bandcamp. Bandcamp.com forward slash Gayfesh. Mm -hmm. Right? Gayfesh.bandcamp.com. Okay, gayfesh.bandcamp. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. Let me make it look nice. There we go. Bam. Okay, we got it. I'm just going to move this over so people can read it. Wham. Okay, we got it. We got it. All right. Let's talk. So, um, yes. Okay. Brain working now. Yeah. So, Calvary <laughs> Chapel. I, I grew up um in well when i when i first was introduced to religion i was not a part of calvary chapel but um right when i when i was probably like nine or ten was when my family started getting involved with calvary chapel and at that point um they their movement had really begun um but we were in a smaller branch of calvary chapel um and it was really wild they exploded really fast and became like a you know, big force in my small state, which has happened in a lot of states. Calvary Chapel has this sort of business plan where they move in and um, kind of take over rural areas and build huge, really politically powerful followings in those areas. Um, and in my opinion, they have incredibly abusive internal leadership practices. Um, oh, absolutely. And yeah, social ostracization. They're incredibly anti-gay. They're incredibly um, anti-evolution. Um, They're incredibly anti-abortion. Um, and they are not afraid of dipping their feet into, um, into politics. In fact, they do it all the time. Um, funding, like giving money, uh, you know, funneling support, uh, organizing protests, all kinds of stuff. They're incredibly politically active. And they also have a absolutely massive worldwide missionary program that's bankrolled by their, um, again, very abusive internal structure. Um, you know, just so people are aware of what Calvary Chapel tends to do. Yeah, there's probably is one that would make sense. Wolfgar, they are again at this point they're they're pretty they're pretty widespread. Um, it's not they're not like a tiny cult anymore. They're like a mega church. Um, the way that they operate, just so people are un understand what we're talking about here. The way that Calvary Chapel tends to operate is um, they will uh, seed churches. So basically, there was a guy named Chuck Smith who really started it all. Um, very, very charismatic guy with a pretty firebrand message. Um, I wouldn't really call him like a fire and brimstone preacher, but certainly very passionate and very aggressive. Um, he pushed the idea of like spiritual warfare, like the idea that Americans in their everyday life are secretly wrestling with devils and helping angels with their daily actions. He um, had a, um, a series called Pagan uh, Invasion, I think. It was like a video tape series that he put out in the early 90s yep. that was all about the satanic panic. Yes, yeah, it was, they were very much yeah. involved in that. Um, and then he, you know, gained a, a lot of um, money and power um in california i believe is where he his original church started and then what he started yeah, to do, i think it was costa mesa yeah costa mesa yep and um so what they would do after that is once they started making money they basically turned the church into a corporation and what they would do is they would invest they would find promising pastors who were charismatic and and ambitious they would move them up within the ranks they would give them money to go build a church in some small town and build a following there and they did this and when they would build a church the church would start as just you know something small and then they would build a bookstore and then they would buy a radio station um and then they would buy 
sometimes a, like a small stadium um, or a school. Um, the church that I went to had all of those. It had a radio station, um, a giant auditorium, and eventually its own school, which I attended at one point. Um, and yeah, so they would give this money and they would fund them and they would send these little seating organizations out and would take over an area, build people in. And they were very good at getting people to give money because they would involve people deeply in the church. Um, and we could even go into, I could, I could go and talk about their rehab programs that they did, which were slavery functionally, um, really fucked up, really, really fucked up organization. Um, and in fact, some of their campuses have gotten so incredibly large, um, that, uh, that, that they were like, they became like local institutions in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, for example. Um, the, uh, the church there is a massive campus in the middle of town, um, with a university, um, daycares, like shops all on this. It's basically looks like a Christian mall and they, w they have services that, that use millions of dollars of wor worth of camera equipment. So think when you're thinking, when we're talking cult, think more like Scientology than like Manson. This is like a Scientology style thing. They get a lot of rich people to give them a lot of money and then they invest that money and they've turned it into a business. So yeah, there's four of them in your city. Yep. They're all over the place now. They've really expanded, but they are a cult. Don't make any mistakes about that. They're incredibly extreme. Um, they utilize social isolation really strongly as a part of their message. Um, they are uh, very manipulative in the way that they rope people in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So those are the basics of Calvary Chapel. And what we're here to talk about is some of our experiences with Calvary Chapel. Specifically, Gay Fesh has done some digging and discovered some interesting stories from his own family's past. So yeah, there you go, Blue Blueberry Cutie. There's 10 of them around. I told you, I'm not making this shit up. I'm not making this shit up. I was just reminded about a town I lived in had a news story about the Calvary Chapel place that suckered a bunch of college kids into going to, stealing their money and estranging them from their friends and family. Scary and what a small world. Yep, I could tell you a ton of stories, but I want to give Gayfesh the chance to tell his story. So go ahead, Gayfesh, take it away. Yeah. So uh, my family um, was involved in Calvary Chapel Church Planting, which is their missionary um, uh, wing. And... Uh, we moved into Russia basically right after the Iron Curtain fell. Um, we uh, spent a year in St. Petersburg and then uh, moved over to a, a smaller city uh, for uh, about two years until the uh, FSB chased us out, which is a side story. But uh, um, my dad was served as the pastor in that smaller city. And um, when we came back from uh from our mission after being chased out uh we found out that um another staff member in our group ha who had left beforehand had uh said some things to our local uh, to the uh pastor in the seattle uh branch that basically um they got the impression that my parents marriage was on the rocks and they would not let them explain themselves basically it was uh, not just, uh, th th their marriage wasn't on the rocks. My mom just had some complaints every once in a while about things that my dad would do as, you know, married couples do. And from that, it was taken to be like, oh, they're about to divorce. This is a major concern. In addition, the pastor had huge problems with my dad, specifically because my dad did not buy wholesale into uh, the uh, until Calvary Chapel's teaching of eschatology, which is the end times stuff, you know, uh, Calvary Chapel has very much always been uh, yep. a pre tribulation rapture um, uh, theology. And if you don't fall in lockstep with that, which my dad didn't, because Do you mind this is a theology that that's only viewers? been around since. Yeah, go go for it. Okay, so when Gay Fesh references a pre tribulation rapture. Um, what that means is there's a belief in Christianity that there's this time period that's coming called the tribulation. And basically this is a time, uh, in which the antichrist will arise. The world will go into a state of, dis of like general disaster. The antichrist will usher in a seeming peace and then everything goes really bad from there. And then it's the end of the world. It's an apocalypse thing. 
Now, the rapture is an event that is disputed among various Christian um, sects. The rapture, they believe, is when basically all, um, you know, all Christians, all faithful Christians will be swept up into heaven, just like, bam, poof. And there are various beliefs on when this is supposed to occur, but Calvary Chapel very, very, very firmly believed that the rapture was going to happen at any moment, that you needed to be ready, and they needed to be fighting really hard because to get as many Christians raptured before the tribulations happen, and if you didn't, you would go have to live through this horrible tribulation. Um, and, and yeah, yeah. So that, I think that accurately sums it up. Basically, Calvary Chapel believes that before the hard times come, all the Christians are going to be yoinked up into heaven. And so you got to hurry up and get as many people converted as possible so that everybody gets yoinked together. Right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. That, that about sums it up. And, uh, yeah, my dad had, uh, he, uh, had questions about it. I mean, he said he was, perfectly willing um in in his uh capacity as a calvary chapel pastor to teach that but privately he had his misgivings about it and uh the head pastor was like um you know that that rubbed him the wrong way that he had somebody in the leadership who would dare disagree with him on anything um and that was something that was a problem with them for a long time and so when we came back and there was this rumor that their marriage was on the rocks, suddenly every single thing that we had done in Russia came into question. And we were not allowed to uh, talk to anyone who had made any accusations at us. It was just, no, you're just going to sit there and you're going to be punished for what we believe you have done. Mm -hmm. And we weren't allowed to contact anyone back in Russia. We we would send like letters and care packages. They would intercept them and take everything and say this was inappropriate. You cannot send this stuff to them. When it's like these people have been our friends for years. These people have nothing to do even with what you're accusing us of. And but no, we were just cut off from them. So uh yeah. Um basically we were on the outs and the the pastor decided, no, you guys are uh gonna uh just uh sit in the uh, uh, sit in the corner until we decide that you guys uh, have uh, made amends for the things that you haven't even been proven of uh, doing. And so we left the church. Yep. Um, and we, we had a couple uh, friends leave with us, but yeah, for the most part, nobody had any idea what was going on. They keep all this stuff. It, you just leadership in Calvary fellowship or the, my, my, the, the church in Seattle was called Calvary fellowship, but it's still part of Calvary chapel. Mm -hmm. The leadership there, is you take these young men, you build them up, uh, uh, you, you, you groom them, and then the second that yep. they have the slightest disagreement, they are disappeared. Yep. You never hear from them again. Yep, 100% same experience. The leadership of Calvary Chapel is incredibly harsh um, and incredibly insular and incredibly personality-based. So there are basically the founding members of the church have almost supreme power that they then delegate down to trusted members and untrusted members will quickly be disappeared out of the out of the um out of the fellowship because of one reason or another i mean this happened multiple times in my own church like there would just be pastors who just they were gone you know and it was just like it was understood that like ah something happened like they did something x thing but then it's just you don't ask about it you just let it go um and yeah, it was very weird. And the thing is too that like of course there's there's the the other the you know there's the standard problems that come with really rigid internal structures where there's tons of favoritism. I mean, pastors kids would get crazy favoritism. Um especially in the school system um because like again, the grooming thing was really big. Um women were taught to take a purely a, a supremely submissive role and there was and it like like completely gendered uh, ministries. There were nights where women would go to learn and then there were nights where men would go to learn and there was general nights. They encouraged like, and I'm sure you probably experienced this too, Gayfesh, but they encouraged multiple nights of church per week. Um, so you would get socially, de you know, dependent on them as your one social outlet would be going to church, would be going there and being able to see your friends, whether or not they were good friends or not, they were the friends you had. And in order to be righteous, you needed to go them, you needed to go after them all the time. 
Yeah, I mean, you need to go there all the time. It's, um... Oh, and the thing is, like, the whole thing about Calvary Chapel is, while, yes, church is still very boring, they, uh, a lot of Calvary Chapels were based around basically not boring church. Like, they would have rock music. Um, they came out of the Jesus People movement. The G exactly. Yep, the Jesus Freaks. Um, and and they, they had rock music. They had, um, you know, they had very intense sermons that were incredibly, you know, like, on fire and, and motivating um they had all of these events that they would do um would you make this akin to what evangelicals do in rural middle america yeah i mean they do operate there um um they didn't actually i mean they would watch stuff like that from time to time but i mean i actually think the prince of egypt is is significantly better than like anything in calvary chapel they would do summer camps yeah they did bible camps um but even more than that not just bible camps they would do a lot a lot of youth camps which i went to many of them i went to many youth camps which are basically you go away from your family for a week you go have fun in the woods with a whole lot of religious education during that time um but one of the things that they would often do is that if it seemed like you were a problem member, and keep in mind that could be much like what Gayfesh mentioned, like up to the determination of a random pastor who could have a grudge against you or something, um, weird shit would happen. I mean, my mom, for example, when she sought out help, like guidance from from pastors, had pastors like in the in the in in complete private make moves on her. Like, and this was not, you could not even say that. And if you did, you would be immediately excommunicated. You would be basically locked out. And they would do this. This happened repeatedly. In fact, later on, many years later, I learned that my uh, pastor had multiple affairs um, using his position of power um, that, and was just never called on it because he could control narratives so strongly. And it was so, it was always so unaccountable on his part, despite that they preached this message of accountability and they always made, um, you know, they always made it so you could never, men and women could never be alone together and all these things like that. But nonetheless, they wielded that power, um, you know, very much, very willingly and were able to control the narrative. Um, to toxic masculinity was very much a, a strong um, uh, current, especially with, uh, with our pastor, uh, my dad, mentioned a story of when they were playing basketball together mm -hmm. and my dad uh double knotted his shoelaces and the pastor goes that's that you're not a man if you double knot your shoelaces like of all things yep double knotting your shoelaces was being a wuss oh yeah they did that same same exact shit um at uh, at the calvary chapel i was at toxic masculinity was absolutely absurd among calvary chapel to the degree that there was like i would argue that there was even like um like borderline hazing um for a lot of men their men's service often involved doing manual labor for the for the church um they would make fun of people for being like gay and wusses all the time um any like abnormal masculine expression would be punished um, they would even do stuff such as like, I mean, hell, like uh, they believed, again, very much in spiritual warfare. Um, one of the movements that um, that moved through my area for a while was the God Sword movement, um, like God's word, God Sword. And it had a big sword with a Bible as the hilt. And they would sell these like leather Bible holsters. And every dude in the church had a leather Bible so holster or else you were like just weak you needed to have your bible on hand like it was a sword they would literally talk about it like that you need to be ready to do spiritual warfare at any time yeah like that's that they they believed that the bible was literally your spiritual sword um and spiritual warfare yeah that was their whole thing i mean but again there was like so much of this uh fuck i'm trying to think of like the did you did you all have like a u-turn or a rehab program at your church gayfesh um, you know, we left when I was like 11. So yeah. if there was anything like that, I was not aware of it. Yeah. 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 So, uh, this is something you might, we find did have a crisis pregnancy center at, at our campus though. Yeah. They did a lot of stuff like that. So, um, at the place that I went to, they had a program that was specifically for, they had a, a seg gender segregated programs for recovering addicts. They were rehab programs. Um, and these programs were ridiculously abusive. 
And while I, there's no doubt to me that some people were able to gain some benefit from this, a family member of mine went through that program and was able to kick their drug habit because of going through this program. I do not believe that it was the most healthy way to do so at all. So let me just give you an idea of the sorts of things that you would have to do once you were in this program. The first thing you would have to do is they would always send you somewhere far away from where you were from because you needed to get away from temptation. So you sign up for the U-turn program. They ship you off to the other end of the country. When you do that, when you arrive, they take your ID, they take your money, they take your passport, they take everything, and it's held in the hands of the leader of the church because you need to get away from drugs, so they're holding it for you. And when you go into these camps, you would, um, every day, like basically the camps that they would have uh, literally were a camp. Like the one that the one that was in my area was a logging camp. They had a big house, everybody lived in together, and then they would cut down trees and sell the trees, and the trees would go to fund the church. But the labor was free because the labor was part of like purifying yourself for God. So you would go do hard labor and have three meals a day provided to you by the church, preaching multiple times a day, prayer groups, things like that. When you went to services, the, um, the people in the rehab program were always seated at the front because part of the thing was, was, uh, fighting sexual temptation. So they would be seated at the very front of the auditorium so that they couldn't look around at other people. So they couldn't look at women in the audience or anything like that. So they would only be focusing on God. Um, this was 100%, um, like enforced. You could not sit elsewhere. Um, and, and they would even yell, like pastors would literally stand on the edges of where the the rehab people were to make sure they weren't like looking around and ogling women or whatever. Um, and then again, of course, I, like I said, there was the women's program, which was same exact principles, just they would, um, they would, instead of doing logging and stuff like that, they would uh, sell out the services of their cleaning team. So businesses that were friendly to the church would be able to get cheap labor, often under the table, almost often completely under the table. And there's nothing you can do. What are you going to do? Go to the police and be like, oh, my church is making me do that. Nobody would believe you. They don't believe you. It doesn't happen. People don't believe you. And you can't build a case anyway, because what are you going to do without your ID and everything? You're just going to be ignored. So this stuff goes under the table all the time. And of course, they usually are doing services for wealthy members of the church who are now getting cheap or free labor. Um, and yeah. Oh, I'm sure much of it is actually illegal, but it doesn't matter because you can't prove it. Um, and then once you got to a certain point, you would graduate from the program and you would be let back into the church. But of course, now you're totally reliant on the church. <laughs> Excuse me. A little bit of a sneeze. But yeah, that was the sort of stuff that they would do. And again, this would allow them to make a lot of money to open a bookstore, to open a school, to open a radio station, which would allow them to grow their message, to reach out, to bring more people. Um, yeah, it was really fucked. And uh, again, they had a huge missionary program, though um, my church was not quite to the degree where we had like a massive missionary program. It was mostly in cooperation with the even bigger churches, but the, the Calvary Chapel missionary program is huge. And the uh, church seeding, like where they go and seed new churches, like I watched when from the time that my family went to Calvary Chapel to the time that it was the end, I watched like six other churches pop up and gain followings. Yeah. So it's very, very wild. Um, you still there, Gayfesh? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. So it was a really interesting thing. But and I talked about this in the past with um, Zan Z about how capital, how like obviously capitalistic Calvary Chapel was. Is that something you remember experiencing at all? I know you m mentioned leaving when you were younger, but did yours did yours oh. have like a bookstore and all that stuff too? Yes, we had a bookstore. It had uh, Christian music. It had books. It had just like two entire shelves of audio tapes from chuck smith specifically that our pastor would if he got backed into a corner theologically in a discussion would just throw up his hands and say go listen to this tape by chuck smith yep that happened a lot too we had a, um we had two things we had okay so at my church we had a a basically a merch shop and a diner where you could go get coffee and snacks and you could actually sit up there and watch the service 
from above. Um, and then we also had a like sermon archive, which had um, like DVDs, just like countless DVDs of sermons from various dates of not just our pastor, but other pastors that were like friendly with our pastor, the famous ones from the movement, whether it's Chuck Smith or um, I can't remember the names of these guys anymore. I probably could if you gave me some time, but like Chuck Smith or uh, fuck the guy who's no longer a part of the church because he was it was outed in, in public that he had a giant affair and fucked over his wife. Yeah, it's actually wild. Yeah, that a huge archive, but it was like you could buy them. You could go in and buy yeah. like. Like for a couple of bucks, you could go buy a whole bunch of sermons that you could play in the car. And again, they when were... I was there, yeah, when I was there, there was just a little bit before DVDs, but yeah, it was audio tapes of all yeah. that fun stuff. Yeah, audio tapes or or CDs. They had all kinds of stuff, and it was like, uh, and again, their main goal, like first, they would work really closely with other like Christian radio and stuff like that. Like we had a Christian radio station in our region, but they ended up making their own local radio station that would just play Calvary Chapel um, sermons by other people and by the local person that would play Calvary Chapel approved music. They had a whole internal like way of like promoting bands, like down to the music that would get played. They would have bands go on tours from Calvary Chapel to Calvary Chapel to Calvary Chapel, like this whole internal economy. It's actually wild. Um, I don't know how I could survive in a church like that. Like I was straight up told I was going to hell with no explanation. My church doesn't even sound that bad. Um, yeah, Calvary Chapel, um, ruined a lot of people's lives. They would really reach their hands into your lives. Like the thing is, is that they would have just enough pastors that like pastors could basically become familiar with every aspect of your life. Um, and would like always advise you to do things in favor of the church. I remember the part where I started doubting the cult was when my sister sought out a pastor, um, the pastor's a pastor's advice as to whether she should pursue education at the incredibly prestigious private school that was in the area that by sheer force of luck, by sheer chance, uh, people in my town could go to for free which is why I got a private school education. I was very lucky to have that because of a random law technicality in the law that said that because my school didn't have a high school of its own, the state had to pay for any school that we wanted to go to. So when that opportunity came, I chose to go to a, a college prep, like a good private school in the area. And my sister had the same choice. She could choose to go there. She could choose to go to one of the nearby public schools, or she could choose to go to Calvary Chapel. And they just said, you know, we really think God wants you to come to Calvary Chapel, of course, because that would mean 10,000 bucks a year or whatever they paid. Um, yeah, it was a panopticon church structure. She was younger than me. Yeah, she was. Um, and when that happened, I was like, I don't think this is fair. I don't think this is good. Like, and keep in mind, my experience was different. Um, while I was, I, I was advised by the lead pastor, you know, to go to, to, follow you know god's will and there was some hinting that going to calvary chapel church you know school would be good um the, the the pastor at that point was still like sort of saying oh yeah you should you know you should follow what god wants for you etc cetera, etc cetera. um that did not happen by the time my sister was going to school um and they just straight up said no you just you just come to the church um, no, wow. I haven't seen that, Dizix, but that sounds interesting. How many people went to the church? When I was there, there was like 1,200 um, active attendees, so it was getting pretty big. Th that was th that was when I left. When I first started going there, there was like um, less than 100 people. They literally just rented out like a, a, a small building that they would use on Sundays and Saturdays and whatever days. And then they actually had to build their own structure. And they ended up um, growing from like, they went from like 60 to like a hundred to like 300. And then they had enough money to build their own facility. Um, they literally bought a public school building, like a, like a public My school building. That public school big... building. What's that? Yeah. 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 Mine was also in a cheap. public school building. They get them cheap as fuck from the state. They can, they will go and buy um, a public school building and like renovate it with slave labor. You know what I mean? And then they'll turn it into their base of operations. And yeah, it's wild. So they had like this crazy school building that they turned into a literal school. Then they built an auditorium in the back of it. It was wild. The appeal was the rock music and community, basically. What was the hook or the promise of a fun community? Well, it was the zealotry. It was the community. It was the, um, the exclusivity. And of course, the biggest selling point is salvation. They offer you meaning. They, they offer you a place to belong, and they tell you how to do it. 
very forcefully how you will belong, what you do to get in, and then once you're in, it's very hard to leave. And to be fair, there were some really cool events that I did while I was a part of Calvary Chapel. Like, I mean, when I did like, like Bibles, Bible, summer Bible camp stuff, that shit was fun as hell. They had a lot of money going around. So we got crazy costumes and everything. It was really fun. I did like theater stuff. I remember I was oh, like- Oh, we a did a lot. I yeah, did a lot of theater stuff. The, um, do, do you ever do any of the, um, oh, what was, was it? Uh, kids praise plays where Salty, the, the anthropomorphic Bible character. Yes. And the Salty thing was like, um, our church actually moved past that after a while and stopped doing Salty and just came up with their own one. So they had the, like, wow. like some internal one that was developed, but previously, yeah, Salty, the big blue Bible, um, Salty. Yeah. He was, uh, he was very popular for a while when the church was small, but once they got big, they got these like wild new things that were like they had members that would write stuff it was really wild how they grew it yeah um, i think we moved uh after after we we moved out of salty we did like it was one that just like a local a member had written but it was a uh, a jukebox musical called at the hop and it was all set in the 50s and stuff yeah we did one that we... was like a um under the sea thing and we were all sea animals and like they paid uh they paid this cost like this member of the church of course who was a costume artist to make like total outfits like i was a, like a seahorse or something that had a, a cowboy hat and i remember i had a whole outfit and like to the degree where like i had a, a hat that was like a seahorse head and it was really funny when i went out to go do my lines uh the seahorse head got hooked on a pipe um above and tore off and all of the children was... laughed at me because the head of the seahorse <laughs> got torn off. I'm not kidding you. That actually happened to me. I was running out. I'm like, hey, everybody, I'm the sea. And then the head ripped off. Now, and I was like, ah! <laughs> when you did theater, did you guys ever go on tour? No, we didn't. We did. We weren't that big. We no. went on tour. Like, I, I think I did either two or three plays where we would, like, actually go around to other churches, uh, not just, like, in the local community, but in other states. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were other churches and... that did that, but mine wasn't quite to that degree yet. Like, cause ours, ours was the first one in my state. So the church that I went to, the one that I watched grow up, was the first seed in my state, and then they ended up branching out and making like six other ones, and then that would. Happen. Well, we didn't even we didn't even just go to other Calvary uh, locations though. Like we we went to other churches, but it was like just this big operation, you know, renting school buses and sending everyone on tour, and then we all like find uh host families to house everyone for the night while we while we perform in their area yeah um something else that's really interesting which i'm sure like given that that you were involved in like the the seattle area church i'm sure they had a lot more funds than like my church but one thing that was shocking to me um was after i had first started going to college and this was when i um this was right before i realized i was trans when i was starting to have a little bit of like some serious doubts about religion um, I went back home for, um, Christmas and my dad was like, we're going to the big Calvary chapel in, uh, Florida. And I was like, oh, okay. And we went there and I realized how much money was being spent on this service. And like, I'm talking about like, they would, they played a video in the beginning about like donating to help people and whatnot. While I look over and they have, they have literally imported snow so that people can snowboard at the giant snow Christmas Christian put the Christ back in Christmas festival that they were celebrating there. Like thousands upon thousands of people with millions of dollars in camera equipment. They're soliciting tons and tons of donations from this massive crowd. The hype is unbelievable. The praise when you give money or when you go and get saved, they would just be like, ah, you know, the crowd would go wild and you'd get all this welcoming in when you converted and all this shit. Um, all of it was ultimately just self enriching this massive organization. And, it, and that made me go like, what the fuck? Like this money could be going to saving people, but it's going to like, I don't know, having s giant snow. Like I could understand like, and at the time I was like, you know, I can understand like spending some things, but this seems really excessive. This seems really, really excessive. And it feels like they could be doing more good if they weren't willing to like self aggrandize to this degree, but they were. Yeah. Um, and Wolfgar asked a question in chat. Uh, how much money did your families have to spend to be a part of their activities? I imagine it's not a small sum keep, to keep up the rate of expansion. So speaking um, as missionary family, um, we had to do our own fundraising to get over there. Um, but all the funds was, still were funneled through Calvary uh, Chapel. Yeah. And one story 
that came up when I was discussing things with my mom a couple nights ago is that uh, there was uh, some um, we, uh, when we were there and we had to renew our visas, uh, it involved us having to uh, Russia required us to leave the country while we renew our visas. So we would uh, we went over to Estonia while we did that. But the the whole trip and everything, you know, with uh, all, you know, it's not just like uh, a married couple it's a family of five. Uh, so uh, I think we estimated it would be about five thousand dollars for the whole trip, train rides, and everything, because we were pretty deep into into Russia. We weren't just right on the border like we were in Saint Petersburg. And that five thousand dollar number was very relevant because we had um, uh, uh, one of our friends had donated to us five thousand dollars. And when we mentioned, uh, and when they were mentioning to uh, to Calvary that, that they needed this funds for uh, uh, you know the travel, very specifically that five thousand dollar number, they were like, "Oh, that's interesting. We just noticed. Here's this five thousand dollar check that had somehow magically ended up in the slush fund, not specifically for you." Mm -hmm. Hmm. Sorry about that. I guess it's going to you now. Yeah, they had no transparency. Like, uh, they would never, these organizations would never tell you, like, how much the pastors were making. They never, you did not ask. You do not know. You do not get to know. Um, and in fact, to ask would be considered, like, gauche. Um, like, it would have been considered, like, wrong. Like, you would have been, like, are you doubting, like, the faith? Like, what the fuck? What matter? What does it matter to you? That was part of it. Um, like, they have so much goddamn money. And yeah, they do encourage you to crowdfund. I mean, some of my family members who are still involved, gauche? Yeah. Um, gauche. Um, um, but yeah, uh, they would, they, they did encourage crowdfunding all the time. I mean, one of my, again, one of my family members who's still involved in the church recent, relatively recently did a, 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 uh, a crowdfund for their own, like raising their child because they're on a mission trip in, in for Calvary chapel in like some other country. And it's just like, whoa, they don't even fucking, they don't even fucking give you um they don't even give the money like it's so wild but the thing is is they're able to command so much social control that people will do anything they'll gladly do it a lot of the time they'll be gladly fundraise for their own thing and people will gladly give but the church doesn't have to and the church encourages tithing of course which is giving 10 percent of your income to the church that's what they consider a tithe is 10 percent of your income that's the suggested amount that you give and People That's will pretty do standard that. among Christianity, yeah. Yeah, ten percent the tithe. Um, so just imagine you've never heard the term. Wait, you've never heard the term gauche before? Oh, okay. Um, or the term tithe. Tithes are common among churches, but usually they're not as strictly um, enforced. But the church will say, "Oh, you know, we we believe in tithing. You know, which is giving a tenth of your income to the church." Imagine that across all of their members, a lot of their members who are business owners, a lot of their members who like own the local a uh, Ford dealership or the boat dealership or whatever, you can see how much money this adds up to really fast. And then also when you consider that they use slave labor and um, it was just a norm, it wasn't required, but it was strongly, strongly encouraged. Um, they kept a pretty clean um, external face. If you left the church, they would leave you alone. Um, that doesn't mean that the members, the individual members of the church wouldn't guilt you into coming back. That happened all the time. In fact, um, people would often be like, oh, I haven't seen you at church recently. Everything okay? Blah, blah, blah. Like that was encouraged. Accountability was often encouraged to like check in with people who hadn't been at church for a while. But the church itself would, would very rarely engage in that sort of thing. If you left, you were just cut out. You go don't get the warmth of the community anymore. All your friends, gone. You don't get any support. You don't get any um, access to saying, I'm, I'm having a hard time. Can we raise money for my house that burned down or any of that? Um, yeah, it was pretty bad. And of course, keep in mind, they monetize everything else too. The food, the school you got to pay for, you got to pay for everything. Um, you know, so they have a million ways of monetizing. The money in it is just absolutely absurd. The money in it is absurd. And again, this is evidenced by the fact that they could build an entire auditorium that they could build a radio station and they have in multiple locations. Once a place gets to a certain size, it's time. Now we expand the business. Now you got the radio station and you have people tithing through the radio. You have people tuning in. You have people, you know, buying your products over the radio. It's wild how much money and monetization there is. It's actually wild. 
Um, and yeah, they were really, again, they're really weird about the social stuff because, um, you would, it would get very cold the moment that you had, uh, and sometimes for no, in, no explicable reason, just to keep you on your toes. Yeah. Wouldn't it be yeah. great to tax them? Yeah, that would be great, but it's, it's hard to make that happen based on the way American laws are. But yeah, tithe was not required. It was just strongly encouraged. So... But yeah, that was a, it was a wild experience. Um, yeah. So it was a very weird thing. And again, of course, uh, this is a church that is, um, supremely anti-gay, supremely, um, anti-evolution. I mean, to the degree that like they had, um, they would engage in, again, like pushing legislation to outlaw the teaching of evolution. That was the type of stuff they did. My church once at one point literally blockaded a porn shop out of business. The porn shop came like just opened up near, near my town and they protested it for like three days straight, completely surrounding the building with, um, yeah, I'm bouncing in my chair with energy. Yeah, it's true. Um, but yeah, like they, they, uh, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to shake the camera there, but they, uh, they, they literally blockaded the porn shop until it closed its doors and left like just my church. The, um, the anti-evolution stuff, they had like Ken Ham books in, in the bookstore. Uh, Ken Ham, for those of you who don't know, is one of the big, um, uh, anti-evolution, um, creationist advocates out there he's had a he had a very public debate with bill nye and um he even wrote like children's books with like illustrations of cute dinosaurs and stuff about mm -hmm. how you know oh the dinosaurs walked with humans because we found uh, a fossilized footprints of humans and fossilized footprints of dinosaurs in the same location and all oh there's a fly it's a stupid fly there. i know this one fly has been evading me it's so annoying um but yeah no that was that would be just like oh here's this cutesy uh book for your kids all about how the uh, you know uh jesus probably rode into damascus on on a t-rex or something yeah do you do you know of kent hoven by any chance yes you yes that dude too yeah i was gonna say oh like, yeah uh, i met and talked to kent hoven like i literally had a, i i had a conversation with kent hoven after one of his uh his anti-evolution um speaking tour th events at my school and like i was like really passionate because i was like super roped into it i really believed this shit when i was younger and i was like oh i really want to seek like his knowledge and find out like how i can make things better and i had like a one-on-one -on -one conversation with ken with uh not ken ham with kent hoven um mm -hmm. kent hoven who then later went to prison for tax evasion um and now it goes on uh modern day debates every once in a while wait is ken hogan does... really on there oh yeah he's there all the time Holy basically shit. anytime yeah anytime modern day debates does like an evolution thing like it's a coin flip whether it's going to be kent hoven or somebody else defending creationism holy shit yeah kent hoven is wild the guy's absolutely like fucking off his rocker the dude is uh very fucked he also has some like very strong like again he went to prison for tax evasion because he literally doesn't believe that, like, the, the American government has the right to take God's granted money to him and all this shit. Yeah, it's Hell really yeah. bad. Um, but he does all kinds of weird... He's very manipulative. Um, his son, Eric Hovind, I think, is also involved in, like, the anti-evolution uh, scene. Um, it's pretty wild. Yeah, I'm not as familiar with what he's done. But, yeah, he's he's his name is around there, too. Fail, yeah, he's a fail son. I mean, actually, the funny thing is Eric Hovind is actually a better debater than Kent Hovind, in my opinion. Um, well, yeah, but that was, a, you know, that's a technicality, a hate no barbus, just it's a technicality. Um, yeah, he's a sovereign citizen type. Yeah, he made a, um, he had a, 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 a theme park. Keep in mind, Kent Hovind is rich enough that he built a theme park on his own property that was called, like, Dino Land or something. And it was all teaching about um, the ways that, like, satan influenced um the development of the theory of evolution and all that shit am i a non-religious i am a, yeah i am an, an, an agnostic atheist is usually how i describe myself i have huge same of, yeah i have huge critiques of organized religion um but i've 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 done a lot of thinking on religion so i don't like outright hate like i'm not like a the like cringe lord anti-theist um but I do have a lot of critiques of it and how it's used and how it can um, be manipulated by those who are in power to maintain their power. Um, in fact, I mean, pe some people know this, but the place where I got my 
named Demon Mama from. One of the there's like two sort of sources for it, but that one of them was that when I started doubting religion, one of my family members said, "I you know I think you're a servant of Satan." um sent to test us and test our faith and i was like so that's where the demon affiliation came with was people calling me like a servant of satan because i just had some questions and doubts and they couldn't answer them because they didn't know how to debate at all watch atheist experience yeah yeah i've watched that before yeah demon mama yeah i watched a lot of that during my uh my conversion uh or deconversion phase yeah when i was deconverting oh. like i watched a lot of zinnia jones i watched a lot of atheist experience um a lot of christopher hitchens um stuff like that um i still have a little bit small small soft spot for christopher hitchens i still think he did pretty good on some things but i feel some like cringe if, takes. i feel like um our, our fond memories of christopher hitchens would probably be dampened if he hadn't died i feel like if he, yeah. he was still alive he would probably have some really bad takes lately but uh he died so he didn't have those takes so you know he's he was a good dude yeah. Uh, mean, while we're talking on the subject of cults, uh, I know I had uh, mentioned this to you in DMs a while back, mm -hmm. but have you ever heard of Teen Mania Ministries? I haven't heard of that. I, I mean, you told me uh, what you've what you've told me about it, but I never knew about that specific one. Yeah, um, Teen Mania Ministries is really the 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 cult that I have the most direct experience with in, in terms of stuff that I directly observed. Uh, most with Calvary Fellowship was uh, Calvary Chapel was just with my uh, with my parents. And I was mostly kept out of the, you know, all all the things. But mm -hmm. uh, Teen Mania Ministries, uh, it's I think it went, uh, I think it went under in 2015, which thank God. Um, but what they would do is that they were based out of uh, Texas. They had their own compound, like about two hours outside of Dallas, um, and they uh, would do um, mission trips all over the world with teenagers. And what they they had this this they had this down to a science. They had um, this roving concert event series called Acquire the Fire. It was like a two day event. They'd go rent out a huge venue uh, in different cities all, all over the world. Uh, they'd put they they'd have big Christian bands playing. I think Rebecca St James was playing when I was there. Um, they they would put on these big like multi day. Uh, um, uh, plays that uh and, and the whole thing was to get people to sign up for global expeditions which was their uh, uh their mission trip thing which is to send uh teenagers on like two week to two month missions all over the all over the place and since and when i went to acquire the fire um rebecca st james i think uh had said that uh, she had actually gone on one of these missions when she was younger. Mm. And I think she said she went to Russia. Somebody said they went to Russia. And when I realized, oh, they're going to Russia, I have to do this. So I, you know, um, I went for a, a month. And uh, fr from there, what they do is um, they they have everything very heavily regimented uh uh there, there's you know tons of rules like you're not allowed to be alone with a member of the opposite sex um well, you're not allowed to severe. have you're not allowed to have non-christian music uh all sorts of things um they they're very much in like they they very much believe in like group punishment and very severe things like there was like my group had had a rule that if if you are late to one of our our big meetings for every second you're late you owe 100 push-ups and one time i had a nap before one of the meetings and they were starting the meeting and someone yells at me get in here they're starting so i run i was 15 seconds late that is 1500 push-ups i cannot do 1500 push-ups in fact I could not do one push-up at that time, which was another thing. They're very toxic masculinity because it's like, oh, you can't do a push-up. I'm like, no, literally, I can't do a push-up. I do not have upper body strength. I've never learned the form. So what they did is they sat me down, and they made everyone else do them and made me watch. Yep. Oh, that, that was something that really pissed me off. In fact, it made me so mad that I actually once yelled at, um, at, at, a, at a junior pastor, which got me in trouble. Um, but one of the, um, one of the youth ministers made my sibling who's autistic, um, cry because they were trying to force him to do, um, do, I can't remember if it was push-ups or sit-ups and 
he he was struggling with it and didn't want to do it. They made him cry, and I went afterwards and I yelled at the at the um at the youth pastor. I was like, "Why would you do that? Do you think that's like that's what God would want you to do? Like that's horrible. This isn't how you do things." Because they did that. They would do that same thing at the Calvary Chapel I was at in the youth program yeah. there. So that was very common to use these sort of things. Yeah. Um, um and uh when you would come back from the mission, you didn't go straight home. You would come back to the compound mm -hmm. in Garden Valley, Texas. And there was usually a three-day debrief. And in that debrief, because they know they are sending kids out to nations, most of which are in the third world. Mm -hmm. So they see the abject poverty that everyone lives in. And they know, having direct exposure to that kind of shit, will prime people to be like, there is something wrong with the way that our world works. Mm -hmm. There is something wrong that we live in such a, a, a rich nation. So they have this whole procedure to be like, you should not feel guilty that you live in a rich country. We have this wealth because God has blessed us. Yes. There is nothing yes. wrong with it. You should embrace capitalism. 100%. You should not You should not change your politics because of this life-changing experience that you have gone and seeing the abject poverty the rest of the world lives in. Yep. And they would, they were, there was tons of anti-communism. We haven't even touched on that, but the church was obsessed, much like most uh -huh. churches are with anti-communism. They would talk about oh, how, yeah. you know, uh, it's illegal to be a Christian in China. It's illegal to be a Christian in Russia. They will kill you. They would talk about this all the time, constantly being oh, reinforced yeah. with narratives that you will be killed. In fact, we would watch, oh my God, you know, you remember Coney 2012? Remember Coney 2012? Yeah. Everybody in chat, yeah. does anybody in chat, there's probably too many young people in chat, but does anybody remember Coney 2012? Anybody remember that shit? Um, if you do, you know, just say it. But yeah, there we go. There's some. Okay. So my church was obsessed with Coney um, before Coney 20, before 2012. Um, so Coney was this um, leader of a group called the Lord's Resistance Army. Um, they are a... I don't know if they're Muslim. I think they're a Muslim group. Oh, hey. Lawboy named Troy, thank you for the tier one subscription gifted to Jobot. Thank you so much. Deeply appreciate that. Um, but yeah, um, Joseph Coney, I think his name was, was a leader of a, um, he was a like a local, he was like a warlord, I think in, it was um, in Darfur, Sudan, if I remember correctly. <laughs> Um, uh, it was in uh, uh, the Lord's Resistance Army was in Uganda, South Sudan, South African Republic, and Congo. And or Congo. Democrat okay, so Republic. yeah, it was that, that region. And, 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 and it was a Christian group. Yeah, okay, so they were Christians. Yeah, but they were the yeah. bad Christians. But they never said that. They never talked about them being Christians. They talked about, um, I mean, they did do horrible things. This Coney guy was a monster, like, no doubt, like, undeniably. But. They would talk about like how you they would kill you for being a Christian. They would hold you at gunpoint and ask you if you would renounce the renounce God and spit on a Bible, and they would shoot you and all this shit. That was constantly, um, constantly uh, reinforced, and that was like, and that was before the Coney twenty twelve thing happened, which was um, Coney twenty twelve was like a secular like guy like grifting or something, um, but yeah, it was actually wild um totally wild and it was constant you would we would get they would have speakers come in who were like from india and they would talk about how oh in india you get killed for being a christian and uh you know there's these marxists it was the anti-communism anti-christian thing is fucking wild it's fucking wild yeah. oh and you know what they, they they love the stories about oh in these countries they'll kill you for being christian because what these christians love more than anything else is a good murder story yes Oh, also, they, um, conspiracy it, theory was, like, all over the place in my church. I don't know if it was in yours, but... It, well, I don't remember that, but, yeah. uh, yeah, no, just, um, there was, uh, yeah, no, this, just, the, the idea that the greatest honor a Christian could have is to die for their faith. It, it's, it's a fetishization of, of, of death. Like, and especially, like, you look into stuff, like, I, I think there was a book called The Martyr's Prayer that w went into explicit detail onto some of the um some of the ways some of the the early christians were were tortured and killed um i don't know how accurate any of these stories are how apocryphal they are but like 
you know, things like uh, being uh, flayed alive with knives, uh, crucified upside down, having uh, knives driven in your nails, all because you wouldn't renounce Christ. And, yes. and it's like, these are all horrible stories, but they relish them. They mm -hmm. love just hearing how much people are willing to be tortured and not give up. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, it's it's kind of gross. It is wild. Uh, the same thing happened in my church, by the way. Incredibly graphic descriptions of horrible things happening to Christians and how that made them more saint-like and strong and all this 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 stuff. Stupid fly. I hate this fly. It's the uh -huh. invasive fly. It's making me frustrated. But um, but yeah. Uh, and then the other thing too is that like, um, again, I, I guess you probably wouldn't remember this, but I I distinctly remember multiple antichrist conspiracy theories going through, um, my church, including Obama. But the most popular one in my church was Arnold Schwarzenegger. They believed Arnold Schwarzenegger met fit all of the descriptions of the um, of the antichrist. And so they believe Isn't that, Arnold Schwarzenegger a Christian? Yes, but that's not necessary. They believed he was like a, you know, because he was in California, they believed he was like, I'm not kidding you. I'm dead serious. This was a popular belief. He's a Republican. What's <laughs> They don't care because it was in California. I'm not kidding you. I'm dead serious. They literally believed that. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's really really ridiculous. Um but yeah, that was something that was unironically um spread around. Um, I remember a time where a kid was like horrifically punished because he was making out with his girlfriend in his car and it was like so one of the pastors like came across him and it like it led to like severe punishment and public embarrassment and and all kinds of shit. He ended up getting like expelled from the school and his family was was like treated really poorly because this happened. Um, yeah, it was really bad. It was like an offense against the church. So much shit. There was so much shit. Yeah, it was wild. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were very, very, very weird. Also, most of the people that I knew who stayed in the church when I didn't, I left the church, obviously. Um, but many of the people I know ended up getting married, like, literally the moment they left high school and had kids by 19, 20. Like, yeah. Yep. Um, circling back to Teen Mania, once you're back, once you've gone on a mission, the next step in the organization is the Honor Academy. And the Honor Academy is uh, not just slave labor, but you pay to be a slave. Um, it is a, uh, a, a year or two year long uh, internship is what they call it. Uh, I think it was like eight grand per year to raise up. And the requirements were that you had to be, um, you had to either have a, a high school diploma or a GED and you had to have gone on at least one mission and you had to be 18 and you had to be under 26. Um, and they ran the, the, the compound, basically. It was, yeah, it, it was all them. And, you know, you live on the compound. You, by the way, uh, Teen Mania was very much poisoned by the whole I Kiss dating goodbye thing. So, yeah. you know, while you are here as an adult in the prime of your life, you are not allowed to enter into any relationships. Mm -hmm. You cannot have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. It's another you can't way that they can think about you. planning about that stuff like that. And, um, you live basically your entire life here on this compound, um, fundraising for Teen Mania, trying to get uh, get kids into um, uh, to join the, the the summer missions programs, uh, planning, acquire the fires, and organizing all that stuff. Um, but there there uh, there was a blog that is has since now um, gone defunct which, you know, it doesn't really need to exist anymore because Teen Mania doesn't exist anymore, but it was called Recovering Alumni. Um, uh, alumni were the term for anyone who had gone on a mission already uh, or were in the Honor Academy. And it was just all, all these stories of just uh, emotional and spiritual abuse that they that they went through while they were there. There were things like um, one story that stuck in my mind a whole lot was one person who was having uh, a, a, a crisis of faith um, while they were there and, and and probably some some mental health issues when they would talk to uh, talk to um the elders in the program they basically just went down a list of well are you reading your bible every day are you praying every day are you involved in a church that's right even though you were at a christian campus uh, cut off from everyone else you were expected to go to a church that was not related to 
uh, Teen Mania every Sunday and cultivate relationships with them while all of your free time is taken up right there on that campus. Yeah, there was a, and, a fuckload of that in Calvary Chapel as well. Of the uh, If you ever have a problem, it's on you. It's on you yes. and your relationship with God. It was hyper-individualistic, yes. hyper, hyper-atomizing. like atomizing. Um, mm -hmm. Despite you having to give your life up entirely to the greater good of the church, if anything goes bad, it's you, and you're not doing good enough. It's one of the main things that they do. A lot of cults do this as well. Um, yeah. is the hyper individualizing bad things, but good things are the product of God and good things are the product of the church. Bad things are the product of your own sin. And there was one thing that I just remembered. Um, Ron Luce, who was the, uh, the, the president of Teen Mania, the founder, um, had very much, you know, a, a messianic complex built up around him. Uh, there was a, a, a running joke uh, a, a, a in among the Honor Academy that he's not Jesus, but treat his word as Jesus, basically. Um, I met him once uh, in person when I uh, was on campus uh, before my mission. And I remember somebody else in my group after meeting him was like, I know he's not God, but that was really cool to meet him. And I'm just like, what? He's just a guy. What are you talking He's just about? A dude. <laughs> He's just a dude. Like he organized this thing and at the time I was like, yeah, that's pretty cool, but like calm down. He's no he's not divine. What are you doing? Um there was I think the most abusive thing that they did though was not Honor Academy. It was a program called ESOAL, which stood for Emotionally Stretching Opportunity of a Lifetime. And what that was was a intensive weekend program that was basically just boot, boot camp slash torture porn. They would put you through the most grueling, abusive, dangerous tasks to strengthen your bond with God by being tortured. Yep. And uh, this was one of the things that got media attention that they actually had to shut down because of just how just bad it was. Too far. Even with like their own internal like um uh, uh um video production like you know how they would sell it like even that when that went public and people saw it they were like holy shit this looks terrible and it this is something that they put out mm -hmm. for it and yeah no it's yeah i i am very glad that, that organization is gone now yeah keep in I mind too, see it at the like, time along that that I, same line like along the same line of these like specialist camps where you go to really test it there's also a lot of things that basically functionally serve as like um, conversion therapy, um, mm -hmm. um, um, like hidden in a lot of these other things. So like um, while it's a little bit of a departure from that exact thing, there was like um, if you were like struggling with like demons, if you were struggling with your own internal demons or you had like sinful intent and whatever, that would almost always result in you basically being um, – put into increasingly extreme situations that basically serve to be conversion therapy, to make you not be gay anymore, to make you not be effeminate anymore or whatever. If you're, a, if you were born male or whatever, so bad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Oh, there was one other thing that just slipped my mind. If it comes back, I'll, I'll, I'll mm -hmm. say it, but yeah. Um, and to address, to address, uh, to address what Wolfgar said, Wolfgar said, this is such an insane, strange world that I feel lucky to have never been a part of. However, Demon Mama and Gayfetch, it seems you guys have learned the right lessons from this experience, so good for y'all. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I am thankful that you haven't experienced that either. It was fucking terrible, and it was terrible at the time, and I didn't know how terrible it was, like, at the time, um, but it was deeply unhappy. I would never go back to that type of life, not even close. Um, it's incredibly isolating. It's incredibly harmful. And to speak to that, like, I can tell you an experience of, like, um, things that later became points for, of learning for me was, like, I remember there was a time when we were go I was going to the beach with my mom and my siblings and my friend. And um, I was playing Pokemon in the back seat. And I kept thinking, because the sermon the night previously... Um, had been about like needing to keep your mind focused on God. And I was so, you know, I took this stuff so seriously that I was sitting there and I'm like, I need to keep thinking about God while I'm playing Pokemon. And I couldn't because I kept thinking about Pokemon. And so I turned <laughs> off my, 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 uh, Game Boy and I was looking out the window and I was just like, okay, I got to think about God more. Like, and then I got so distressed. I was so distressed as a kid that I ended up talking to my mom and being like, mom, I can't think about God all the time. 
like, uh, what am I doing wrong? Like, I feel like I'm too distracted by the beach and by Pokemon and stuff like that. And my mom was like, oh, you don't have to worry about that sort of thing. You don't really literally have to think about God all the time. So good on my mom for catching that part. But like, mm -hmm. um, but I remember that's how much it disturbed me. It disturbed me so much that I like ruined entire events of my life because I just couldn't enjoy them. You know, I because I was just like thinking about God. Do you want to know the thing that, that always got me? Yeah. Um, I accepted Jesus when I was three. Mm -hmm. And I recognized as a later child that at three, how could I possibly have had the cognizance to know what I was doing? Mm -hmm. Or how did I even know that I said it right? Yeah. And this developed in me a kind of OCD compulsion to constantly ask Jesus into my life and like I would repeat it like a mantra like five or six times and I had to make sure I had the words exactly right yep. otherwise it wouldn't count and I would go to hell oh a hundred percent like um I remember mm. like I had mm. every single night I had a certain prayer that I would say in a very specific order I mean I haven't said it in years but I I think I could remember it like if I wanted to but it'd be really creepy for me to read that out on stream but um I would have this specific prayer where I would always make sure to mention all three members of the Godhead, you know, um, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. I would always make sure I mentioned all of my family members. I would always make sure I asked about anything and confessed all of my sins every night and then made sure that I asked Jesus to continue being in my life. Same exact thing. They they induce, um, like, obsessive compulsive behaviors, um, and it actually affected other parts of my life. Like, I don't, I don't think I have, like, OCD or anything now. But when I was younger, there were times in my life where I would be paralyzed at simple decisions like what should I wear today or what should I eat today because I didn't know which I felt like I, like God should be telling me which one I should be going, but it wasn't there. It's very damaging. These things are incredibly damaging to your mind. And um, I, I do um, I do agree, um, Wolfgar, that like I have I have I'm strong in that I've overcome it. I think that that's a good way of putting it. But I don't know. Like, I feel like people can be stronger without having to deal with these down, downfalls. In fact, a lot of people never make it out. You know what I mean? Like, I'm rare. I consider myself lucky to have gotten out of that. Most of my family never, like, a lot of my family never got out of that. A lot of my family never got out of the damage that was done. So, um, yeah, I do think I have a unique perspective. But I also had, like, sort of a unique story. Like, I had friends who helped me get out of it. I had uh, influences in my life that helped me get out of it. So, yeah. But, yeah. Um, I remember the thing that, oh, that I wanted to. Um, so one thing that uh, they, one of the big th signs of a cult that the, they'll tell you is like that the, they have their own internal language, mm -hmm. like the, their own terms that are very specific to the cult mm -hmm. to try and you know have language that's just isolating. And this isn't something that I picked up on at the time, but right after I got out of uh, of my Teen Mania mission. Uh, at my local church, there was another girl who had gone on one as well. Uh, she only went on a two-week mission, so we never actually saw each other on campus. But we were reconnecting at the church. And the conversations that we were having about, like, uh, the groups that we were in, they had, like, specific, like, a they had, like, three-letter acronyms for so many things. And we just kept saying, like, MIG, MAG, TAG, all this other stuff. And I was realizing... Somebody outside of us has no idea what we are talking about right now. It was so specific, and just all this language was so specific to Teen Mania that it was just like, this is one of those things. This is one of those exclusive language things to a cult. Yeah. Oh, 100%. And there's varying degrees of it, too. Like, um, Calvary Chapel at large will use a lot of um, terms that stick with you. Um, things like witnessing. Um, oh, yeah. Things like um, accountability. Um, things like, uh, fuck, I'm trying to think of all these words. Those are like the two that immediately come to mind. Like witnessing is a thing that cr other, other extreme Christians will get, but nobody else will. Does anybody know what that means? Does, is there anybody in chat who like, isn't me or gay fesh who knows what witnessing means? Do you know what it means to witness? No? Testify? Yeah, you're getting there, Busy B. Yeah, Fawn knows. No clue what witnessing is. See, this is the thing. Only people, um... Yeah, not a Christian. Yeah, I grew up in the South. Okay, so yeah, some people who live in very, um, very much, um, like, religious environments will. But again, you have to have that, otherwise you just never will know. Um, it's, uh, it's, um, yeah, so, so, 
when you're witnessing to someone, it means you're telling them the, uh, the truth of God. It means you are like, it's really complicated. Basically, it means you're telling them the truth of God. You are acting as a witness of God's miracles and you're telling them. Um, and that's the way, that's what that means. Um, so they would say, oh, I'm, I'm out here. Like, like literally they would do nights. There would be youth group nights where they would send people out into the streets of the city and, um, and to go witnessing to people, which means you go and you go preach to them. You go street preaching. You tell them the thing. Yeah. It's proselytizing. That's what it means, but they call it witnessing. Um, they use another term like accountability, um, I think is one of them. I, I'm trying to remember the other one. Um, the other term that they would use for this, but basically what that means is that like what accountability means is that basically you're never alone, like, um, with your temptations. You're never alone with a girl. Um, you're never alone. Like if you have a drug problem, you're never alone in a, in, with people who you may have used to do drugs with. Um, all right, all everyone find your accountability partner. Yeah. Accountability. Yeah, exactly. Ex yeah. Yeah. There's the, isn't that, is that the, the King, King of the Hill or, or what's the that? Accountability buddy? Yeah, accountability Park, buddy. Yeah, yes. the accountability buddy. Yeah, I remember seeing that on South Park and laughing my ass off because I was like, yep, that was my teenage life. Yep. Yeah, accountability bu accountability buddy was, was a real thing. Yeah. Um, like, they didn't use that exact term. But yeah, accountability was used all the time. Um, and it was especially, keep in mind that there was a gender dynamic to this. Accountability was um, almost always talked about with regard to women and and men and relationships between them and like women were supposed to be accountable to other women at all times and men were not supposed to be um like you were supposed to be accountable so that people knew that you weren't like fucking ogling women or whatever they were obsessed with that obsessed with sex obsessed with policing sex um mm -hmm. yeah so very wild oh yeah also um baptism is a thing i know that for some people this will sound really boring um, but baptism was a huge part of, of Calvary Chapel. Um, baptism being, uh, for those who don't know, baptism is when you are basically, you know, dipped in the water. It's a, it's a ritual where you are dunked in the water and then you come out and it's supposed to symbolize you being born again as a new person, your sins washed away and devoting your life to God. Um, with, uh, baptisms were really, really popular at my church. Um, and over time they moved away from their super highly ritualistic, um, elements to more like to bring more people in where they would have like this golden bathtub and then they would dunk you in it and whatever. But originally when my church first started, they would do baptism days where they would have a cookout at like some park, like a national park or whatever. And then you would go out into the ice cold Atlantic waters, which was part of the point, And they would dunk you under this ice fucking cold seawater um you know fully clothed just dunked right in and then everybody would fucking clap and praise you for having accepted the new thing and i had that happen they would even take pictures and then give you a framed version of the picture to make it that big of a deal um this event in your life somewhere in my house is still the picture of when i was baptized at like age 12 or something um and just going into the cold water being dunked under and then coming out and being praised by all of the members of the church, all the pastors there smiling at you. And yeah, they would frame it for you. Yep. They made I it was a huge baptized deal. at five. Yeah. Um, and it, we didn't have like a big baptismal, but because this was in Seattle, we actually would just, uh, we actually frequently did events at Green Lake, just like outdoor events mm -hmm. at, at Green Lake Park. And so I was baptized in Green Lake. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, they ritualize, I mean, it's to varying degrees. Of course, the ritual, the ritualization always is second to the growth and profit. That's why if they stopped doing the fucking ocean ones, once they had so many members that it was easier to pressure people into doing it on the spot. That's another thing they would mm -hmm. do. Um, laying on hands was something my church did. Um, the only thing like our church really frowned on, uh, speaking in tongues and stuff because that was too weird. That was another thing. They really tried to control their public image and they didn't want to be associated with like people speaking in tongues. One last question before we end this section of the discussion. Um, yeah. Did you ever watch They Sold Their Souls for Rock and Roll? No, I don't think so. Okay. I think I know what we're going to do for our mod event this week. Oh, month. that sounds fun. I'm going to get us a copy of They Sold Their Souls for Rock and Roll. Um, we will not be able to watch the entire thing because it's literally seven hours long. Um, Jesus Christ. But it's a seven-part... Okay, actually, originally, originally, 
it was a nine a nine part i think um but new versions of it are only seven um because originally they had a end times prophecy segment and they were proven wrong, so they cut those out. But if you find the original version, it's like nine hours long, and it's all about how uh, it's about like rock and roll, how rock and roll is actually Satanism. It's a giant conspiracy theory series that talks about how rock and roll. We watched this in my youth group. We watched the entire thing. I'm not kidding you. We watched the entire series, um, learning about how rock and roll was literally a deal with the devil. Um, you know, uh, that like some black guy made a deal with the devil and that's where rock and roll came from. And they had all of these facts and stuff and spooky imagery. And then there was a segment that talked about Halloween and how, um, oh, it's so fucked with the Halloween part goes absolutely nuts. Complete satanic panic. They talk about how, like, they literally tell like in the Halloween segment, they tell stories like, like extremely graphic stories of ritualized satanic rape. I'm not kidding you. I'm not kidding you. Um, and then there's like an end times prophecy one, which isn't in the new versions of they sold them souls. They sold their souls for rock and roll actually wild. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, so, uh, I think, I think that would be a really fun mod event to watch that. Um, I actually I just Googled it and it looks like they've got it, it down to a three hour version. Oh, they have a three hour Amazon. version now. They've cut it down. Yeah. Huh? It's like, mm -hmm. damn sneaky. Um, that's really interesting that, that Calvary Chapel would push this thing about how rock and roll is the devil's music when so much of their, their worship service stuff is built on having rock Christian music. Rock. Yeah, um, it's, yeah. it's really weird. It's a really weird thing of double think, but basically they viewed themselves as reclaiming this, this musical style. It's very weird. Um, but yeah, we watched that whole fucking thing. Um, yeah, it's, it's really, really weird double think, but nonetheless... They very much supported it, so, and there were people who didn't think highly of the of the rock and roll. Um, one of the cringiest things I ever experienced. Um, oh, I'll check that out in just a second. Four hundred four. I think I got that one there. Um, one of the most cringiest experience. Do you know? Are you familiar with the song? Like, uh, it's like it goes like God of Wonders Beyond Our Galaxy. Oh yeah. You are holy. Oh, holy. Yeah, 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 yeah you one. know it. So someone did a cover of that but literally the same setup except one guy in the in the band in this youth band was super super passionate about growling like metal growls and nice. so he did a growl cover but the same <laughs> thing you know uh they had like the little tambourines they had the women singing the tambourines they had a guy with a guitar and then yeah. this guy just going like rawr, rawr, rawr. god of wonders beyond our galaxy and i was like yeah. It was one of the single most cringiest experiences I've ever had in my entire <laughs> life. It was like the level of cringe, like uh, like ascendant cringe, where I was like, my soul was firing backwards out of the entire room, out of the auditorium, out of the town, out of this galaxy. Like, I was just like, I've never cringed so hard in my entire life. Because of course, you know, everything else was the same Christian thing. The other people involved with the group were just doing their own thing, like with the little shaky eggs, the little ch ch you know what I'm talking about? The little shaky eggs oh, yeah. that every church, every Christian I love those church eggs. Has. Yeah. Every church has those. That's how you, that's how you identify if somebody grew up evangelical, the shaky eggs. If, if people know what a shaky egg is, and that's not a maraca, it's an egg. There's specifically these little eggs with rice in them and they go, ch -ch 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 -ch. and every evangelical church in the world uses those fucking eggs. I swear to God. <laughs> Are they called chick chacks? No, chack chack. No, they're not. We just call them eggs. But yeah, I'm sure other people know of them too. But no, they're not maracas. They were little tiny eggs. They literally looked like a, like they were sh egg shaped and everything, and they had a little chicken icon on them with a little cross. They were pretty much made for churches. They're like a little rhythm thing with like rice or beans in it, and it would go. Ch -ch -ch -ch. Yeah, you popped one open. Oh shit. Is Charlie Kirk a part of my church? I don't believe so. I think Charlie Kirk is like associated with Liberty University, which is a different brand, but they do that's, a lot of the that's, same. Uh, hey, whoosh. Is that the Falwells? Uh, yeah, the Falwells is uh, Liberty University. Yep. Yeah. Which Jerry Falwell Jr. is no longer associated with after his most recent uh, belong uh m m most recent blunder, I should say. Yep. You know, uh, if you're going to be a mega pastor, 
have as much sex as you want. Just don't make anyone find out about it. Yeah, a hundred percent, all of them, every single one of them. Um, the tr I found out later um, from incredibly credible sources how many affairs um, my pastor had had during the years that we were there. I the the entire um, Calvary Chapel in Fort uh, Fort what was it called Fort Lauderdale um what completely like like they blew up and i mean they're still going but like they've they took a significant hit because their lead and founding pastor um had been having like a horribly abusive affair with with uh one of his like aides um yeah it's really bad um yeah it's a fucking mess these churches are fucked uh calvary chapel's fucked yeah kind of yeah. cringe it's kind of kind of mega cringe. I'm very very every time I talk about this, I'm always so happy that I don't have anything to do with these type of churches anymore because it really was agony. It really was fucking agonizing. Um so yeah. Damn. Um sick. Uh Gayfesh, was there anything else you wanted to talk about before you go? No, nope, that was it. All that right. was a great conversation. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. It was super super cool and um we'll obviously talk again soon, I'm quite sure. So thanks for coming on, Gayfesh. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yay! That was a good convo. That was such a good convo. We love Gayfesh. Yay, Gayfesh. Uh, let's see. Let's see. So um, we've been going for six hours. So, you know, I think we're going to end stream because I'm really, really hungry and I don't have any more content now since there were two cancellations today. However, however, I have something to announce. Oh yeah, I gotta check that out. I'll check out that link. Yes, I will react to this link. Let me react. Let's take a look. Let's take a look. We'll do this first. Don't go anywhere. We're gonna react to this first. I'm reacting first. And then I'm gonna announce one thing and then we're good. This is not my church, but I bet there's some similarities. Let's take a look. Let's take a look. Strike and strike and strike and strike and strike and strike until you have victory. For every enemy that is aligned against you, let there be that we would strike the ground for you will give us victory, God. I hear a sound of abundance of rain. I hear a sound of victory. I hear a sound of shouting and singing. This is weak shit. This lady is weak. Her preaching is weak. I've seen way more fire and brimstone stuff. Strike and 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 strike until you have victory. Actually, I can show you. Watch this. Hold on. Let's see. Let me think of some of the famous people. Let's see if I can find one. Jesus. This is his last sermon. Holy shit. Well, let's see if he has one about spiritual warfare. Here we go. Hey! Thank you so much. Angels from Africa. Here we go. Let's take a look. Oh, this is, this is beta audio. We can't do that one. Let's find a better one. Oh, hey, he's got one about last days. Let's see. Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before oh his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, where Peter tells days, and that God was going to destroy the world with a flood. This is the boring version. Even so. I know who I could look up. I know who I could look up um for calvary chapel let's see here's some of the famous ones here we go let's look at this guy i know of this guy here we go this guy's a wild dude this guy's a wild dude awesome well, you know what? While we're working on our speech, while we're working on our speech, my dear brothers, you guys are all aware, and none of you are so foolish as to follow the example of the crass, the careless, the 
the trendy guys who thought it would be really cool to throw in profanity and get, get you know, street level. I guess that's what they were trying to do. Now, we're not that stupid, right? Of course not. But there is one particular four-letter word. Starts with an F. And it needs to go. Get ready. It's the word feel. I have literally sat through a, a sermon by this exact guy. <laughs> this exact sermon, mind you. Get it out of your, your get it out of your vocabulary. I am talking to men of God who keep going. Well, I feel I feel like the Lord's doing a thing. I feel a I feel like a. <laughs> Did I not tell you this? Did I not tell you? that the toxic masculinity thing was so permeating. This was a speech he did many times. I have sat through this guy's speech, this exact speech. Hey, what are you doing right now? Well, we were doing this and now we, we feel like the Lord's calling. We feel, you feel, you don't feel. The just shall live by faith alone. I, I, I I just did a red eye last night coming back from Oregon and we had a great time. The Lord was with us there and I went on this rant with the, the brothers there. Because I see everywhere, everywhere I turn, I'm, I'm counting them. I'm that way. I'm counting. Whoa, whoa. I, you just did three. I feel. Stop it. And, and then I, I go on this rant and I'm on my way out of there. I got to fly out of Portlandia and stop on the way to the airport at a Panera Bread. And I'm standing there, looking at the menu. I don't know what it, I can't, I'm looking at a sandwich, and it's a steak and arugula, but I can't remember what arugula is. Ha, ha, I know ha, that's ha. stupid, but anyway, so I turn. Get it? Get it? Arugula is gay. Ha ha, because they're in, they're on the West Coast. It's gay. Get it? Man, no eat vegetable. A young woman in line, and I said, excuse me, you, what's arugula? Her opening words. I feel like you either like it or you don't. I feel like making fun of a woman right away. And, then, and there's a, it's crept into the church, brothers. There, there, this, this, is, this is the weirdest phenomenon, and I remember noticing it when it entered culture. And it was about a decade and a half ago, and all of a sudden, that age group that were college age could never say, I know, I think. They never could make a statement without I feel in front of it because that has supreme authority. You can't argue with that. It's what they feel. It's their reality. I mean, it's like everything, it's constantly. I feel, like, I, I, feel, I feel like you're mocking me. No, I'm not. It's not a feeling. I am mocking you. I feel like even, even the things that aren't feelings. You're like, what did hey, I tell you? What did I tell you? you people, anybody see my keys? I feel like they're in the kitchen. <laughs> it's not a feeling. Stop it. That's a thought. You have facts. You got something. Give me something more than your feelings. Looking for the key. Because it's a cult. That's why they're laughing so all the time. Correct it. This isn't yourself, a laugh track. This is the actual. The no, 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 no. This is what would happen every time Calvary Chapel people would give sermons. They were programmed. World around you. But don't be, don't be, don't be talking about. Think about it for just a second. The, 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 the apostles of our Lord. Did any of them write the word feel once in any of their epistles? You imagine the apostle Paul. But they didn't write in English. So, yeah. Timothy, I feel like you need to stay in Ephesus. As you can see, hates gay people. Absolutely hates gay people. And then you get you get that uh, that that silly synthetic Christian pop hit from Toby Mac. I feel him in my heart. I feel him in my soul. That's how I know. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> And you go, did you, did you get that at Liberty University? You, you feel him, that's how you know? We need to confront that one head on, but to the text, brothers. Besides that, on top of all of that, where men 
We have feelings, but they're small. They're not worth talking about. Damn. Damn. Yeah, look, this is from Calvary, one of Calvary Chapel's own accounts. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I wasn't making this shit up. I'm not fucking making it up. I ain't telling you lies. I'm telling you the truth. Yup. Yup, yup, yup. It's very fucked. Incredibly fucked. 